All right, hello, welcome. My name is Shayna. I'm an astrologer, tarot reader, and garrulous loner, which is why I love to make really long videos talking about books on the internet. <laughs> this is part two of my witchcraft slash occult book collection and review series. To get the advertising out of the way, I have an astrology TikTok, which I do go live every week on, so you should check that out. I also have a personal Instagram and and I sell birth chart readings. It's shaynaemily.com, which thank God everything's aligned now. So if you watched the last video, which I would recommend doing because, well, you don't have to, you, you can do whatever you want, but <laughs> I would recommend watching that video because I'm doing these in the sequential order that I read them. And I like to think it tells a little bit of its own story as to kind of my spiritual journey, my witchcraft journey or whatever shenanigan phrase you want to fucking call it. I feel like the last part was really pretty family friendly books, um, not too controversial. And I think that in this part, we start off pretty easy, but we slowly, I feel like, get more and more controversial kind of as the books go along, which you'll be seeing that as a theme as these videos go along. Also, yes, I am sunburnt. And yes, I did pick a top that like really displays the sunburntness that I have. I am still very excited to film this video. I still stand by the fact that I love talking about books, all that same shit, blah, blah, blah. But you know what? I have a lot to get through and I have a lot to talk about with each book, so let's just get into it. I think we're on book number 10, and so that book is Living Wicca, A Further Guide for the Solitary Practitioner by Scott Cunningham. Now, I read this. Um, obviously, if you watched the last video, you saw that I read the first book, which is just Wicca, um, and I loved that book so much, and as I mentioned in that video, I was like, I'm gonna be a Wiccan, and I was like really convinced. I was putting a lot of time and energy into research it and making sure that that's the path that I wanted to go down and then I loved his book so much that I was like oh my god he has another book within this series obviously I'm gonna get it and I'm gonna read it um I do not like this book as much as I like the first one I can simplify this book into the fact that it is a Q and a <laughs> it is a Q and a session after the movie for the movie you just watched you know it's okay but also, you know, nobody ever really asks the right questions and a lot of it is kind of rhetorical and a lot of it you can kind of answer yourself. But basically he took all the questions that he got the most from the first book and put it into the second book. But I literally read this book in one evening and this is the kind of book that it's like, one evening? It's a little bit too short, I feel like, because it just didn't really give me much further information. It kind of, like I said, a lot of the questions that he answered, I'm sure were questions that a lot of people were asking. I mean, honestly, people collectively are pretty stupid and ask pretty redundant questions. And so a lot of it was just him being like, I feel like he was rolling his eyes while he was like typing this out, being like, you guys really don't get this. Like, you're really asking this question so much. Like, I'm tired of answering it, so fine. Fuck you, I'll put it in a book so you can buy it. I get why he wrote it, but it is not necessary. It's not worth buying. It's not really worth reading. I mean, yeah, it only took me a night and I'm glad I read it, but honestly, if I could go back, I wouldn't buy it. Um, I don't think it's worth the money. I don't think I wasted my time reading it, but it's one of my least favorite books I have because it's just so redundant and it's just not necessary and I just didn't feel like I learned that much after coming away from it. I think that the first book that he wrote is pretty complete in the kind of beginner guide for being a solitary practitioner of Wicca. I, obviously there's so much more information about Wicca, but this isn't the book that you need to read about it. So I would honestly only give this like, oh my god, do I want to be so mean that I give it two and a half stars? But yeah, I just give it two and a half stars. On to the next book. So throughout my journey with Wicca and witchcraft as I was online and looking at a bunch of Wicca information I just really found that kind of as I mentioned in the last video that this is not the route that I want to take as I mentioned it's a little bit too love and light and through my journey with Wicca online I was like 
oh damn, actually there's like so much more out there. And so I started to look into traditional witchcraft and I started to look into just kind of more open-ended witchcraft paths in general. Like I thought Wicca was kind of like an end-all be-all kind of all-consuming thing and it's not. There's a ton of different witchcraft paths, almost like there's cottage core and then there's like grunge fairy core. There's also like being a hearth witch, being a kitchen witch, being a like planetary witch or whatever the fuck, you know what I mean? There's tons of different witch cores out there too. <laughs> uh, so I started doing more research and then I found this book called The Crooked Path, which is the next book I read. And this cover is beautiful, first I have to say. Come on, that's very enticing. <laughs> it is uh, The Crooked Path, an introduction to traditional witchcraft by Keldon. Everybody really, really highly recommends this book and I see why. <laughs> um, this is such a great book and I'm honestly really glad that I had some understanding of Wicca and witchcraft before I read it because it is an introduction to traditional witchcraft but traditional witchcraft is not just general witchcraft. Traditional witchcraft takes basically as honest to the olden days that we can. Um, it takes those practices and sticks with them as kind of politically correct as we can. Now obviously there's they're not sacrificing people or animals in this book. None of that shit's happening at all. But you know, you tread the mill, you got the besom, the sword, and the stang. You know, all the words are very like olden time witchcraft English. It helped me understanding that there's like the Wiccan circle and then learning what a compass round is because the words in traditional witchcraft are a little bit obtuse. <laughs> you know what I mean? A little bit um, geeky. <laughs> So this book is fantastic. This author is fantastic in his writing style as well. And it's also really cool how it's set up because there is a lot of hands-on things to do. For example, he talks about what a stang is. And then exercise nine is creating a stang. And he talks about how to create your own stang. So like kind of Scott Cunningham just kind of talks about everything. He talks about it and then tells you an exercise to do with the new information you've learned. So it's really nice because it's so, so, so easy to get into the rut that almost everybody does when you get into witchcraft, which is reading a ton about it, buying things, learning a bunch about it, but not actually doing it. And he is like, nah, bitch, if you're gonna read about it, you're gonna do it. Um, and so I absolutely loved this book. And again, I don't think I'm necessarily go going to go down the route of strictly traditional witchcraft. I'm definitely in a phase, at least right now, where I am so scared. I, I honestly will use the word scared. I'm really scared to put myself in any sort of box or category. And I know there's a word for that. And I'll put it on the screen right now. I want to call it like an enigma witch, but that's like not even the term at all. I just made it up right now. And it sounds a lot cooler than it actually is. But I do want to learn about every path and use a little bit of that information in my journey. And so when I was reading this, I was still in the mindset of like, I need to follow a path, you know, so I was like, do I want to follow the traditional witchcraft path? This is just a fantastic, fantastic book. And the cover is so appealing to me, <laughs> which is so dumb. Um, but I give it five stars, like 1000% very confidently would say that if you are into the witchcraft stuff at all, even if you have no interest in traditional witchcraft, because it is a very English British kind of vibe. And this is a book that definitely solidified the fact that I don't want to be a Wiccan. But it also solidified the fact that I love witchcraft and it's something that I want to continue looking into and continue to follow. So I couldn't recommend this book enough. And even the name is appealing, The Crooked Path, like, yeah, I'll walk on that. All right. The next book that I read is another one of those books that I picked up at the Iliad bookstore at the same time as the other two from the last video. And it's another Wiccan book, but... I'll explain. So this is The Wiccan's Dictionary of Prophecy and Omens by Jarena Dunwich. Maybe. It is literally just a dictionary and this is not something that 
any person in their right mind would read from cover to cover. Um, and since I'm not in my right mind, I read it cover to cover. It just defines different forms of divination, basically, like prophecy and omens. And it said the Wiccans Dictionary, but it's not really Wiccan based. This is actually, <laughs> this is going to sound surprising, but this is a lot more towards the very roots of traditional witchcraft in the sense of what kinds of divination were they doing when there were no fucking rules and they were like yeah let's do blood divination let's um murder this lamb and whichever way the head falls that's going to foretell the, our future <laughs> you know like really crazy ass shit like that or you know it talks about the I Ching it talks about astrology it talks about you know throwing lots it talks about palmistry here's a random one that I opened to demonomancy the art and practice of divination through evocation of demons. Dendromancy, the art and practice of divination by oak trees and mistletoes, a method common among the druid priests. This was really easy to read, but it was honestly kind of fun because the forms of divination that they did were absolutely batshit crazy and 1000% illegal now like for good reason oh look necromancy you know it, it, the examination of fish of either living or dead especially by interpreting the entrails of fish it should only be performed when the moon is positioned in the astrological sign of pisces which is the fish like i know it sounds goofy and again it's probably not a book that anybody other than me would be that interested in reading and it really also opened my mind up to all the kind of different forms of divination that we kind of experience day to day that we look past. It made me realize that you can kind of look at anything through a much more unique lens, through a predictive lens, through a divinatory lens, and it kind of made me feel a little bit inspired. <laughs> Which I know sounds very surprising and really odd, um, but it made me want to learn like a bunch of more forms of divination. Like I've been dying to learn like bone throwing and all that sort of stuff. Would I recommend this as like a must read? No. Would I recommend this as like something to everybody that they need to read if they're into witchcraft? No. But am I really thankful I happened to grab it? Fuck yeah I am! Fuck yeah! <laughs> weird to read there's so much you know you don't even know what weird ass shit is in this book um so i'll give it like 3.7 stars but it is a weird book to read because it literally is a dictionary <laughs> but fuck it all right the next book that i read is the complete guide to chakras um by ambico waters it says this is the vintage edition and it says unleash the positive power within <laughs> So it must have been about 2017 that I picked this book up. Yeah, this book has quite a storied past. I used to use it for something of quite a nefarious nature. Um, so it's got some like grub on it. <laughs> but then I actually was like, all right, I need to stop um, using this as a tool for something it's not for and um, read it. <laughs> So I did. This is a very like, not, it's not modern at all, but you can see it's like fake aged and there's a lot of like pictures going on, a lot of different segments. So this is not um, written like a traditional book, but I really wanted to learn about the chakras, obviously. I knew nothing about them when I was reading them, absolutely nothing. And so it took me, um, uh, actually, it took me a little bit of a, some time to grasp. Um, it basically, as you would expect, it has a pretty chunky section on each chakra. So for example, like we have the root chakra. So in every one of the chakras, it has like qualities and attributes. Um, it talks a little bit about it. It shows you where it's located on the body, the color. It shows archetypes associated with it, physical body parts associated with it, the astrology associated with it, and meditations, as well as like crystal associations. So there's a lot of information. It even has at the end this little like questionnaire for each chakra. So you can kind of answer them in your own mind or in a journal and kind of see how healthy each of your chakras is, which is really nice. I actually did wind up going through and kind of like answering and assessing each one. This is a little bit of a kitschy book, but that doesn't mean that the information in here isn't solid. And a lot of the chakra books have that vibe to them. And I wish I could like put my finger on how I'm trying to explain it, but I feel like you know what I'm talking about. They're like white, 
fake yogi, have ohms on them everywhere, and the language is just esoteric nonsense, and it just doesn't really appeal to me. I really enjoyed reading this one. It helped me a lot. Um, I honestly, I wouldn't maybe read it again cover to cover, but I would look through it again and use it as a really nice reference guide. So I would recommend that you read this book, and it's definitely given me a really good base understanding of the chakras. I would probably give it four stars. All right, the next book I really like, and this is Asteroid Goddesses by Demetra George and Douglas Block. Um, the Mythology, Psychology, and Astrology of the Re-Emerging Feminine. Um, it does kind of suck because this looks like a really chunky book, and this is my least favorite thing about it, because let me show you how much of the book is ephemerides and how much of the book is information. And you know with the way that modern life is now, we don't really need an ephemeride list, but like this is the amount of information and this is the amount of ephem ephemerides. Ephemerides, now I'm like, oh my God, have I been saying it wrong? Am I saying it wrong? I maybe am and everybody's like twitching and dying that's watching this, but oh well, you can correct me meanly in the comments and say, you stupid bitch, this is how you pronounce it, you dumb fuck. You don't know anything about astrology and you deserve to get your license revoked. Well, haha's on you, I don't have any license. <laughs> Okay, so I found this book in like Joshua Tree, if I'm not mistaken, when I went, which is how Joshua Tree of this book, you know, the re-emerging feminine. But I was looking for a book about asteroids for I shit you not so fucking long. So, 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 so long. Because there is, I mean, maybe this has changed a little bit now, but there was such little information on asteroids online. Like it drove me absolutely batshit crazy, especially because there are some asteroids that I really like to use and I think are really important and should not be ignored. And the asteroids that they focus on in this book, because they only focus on four, but they dive really, really deep into the four. They focus on Ceres, Pallas Athene, Vesta, and Juno. All incredibly, incredibly important asteroids. And they talk a lot about the mythology, all the asteroids through the signs, through the houses, and they even talk about the aspects. So Vesta to Sun, Juno to the Moon. That is really, really rare to find and really great information. What's also really cool about this book is that all those four asteroids are feminine energies. And if you go through the planets in astrology, pretty much the only feminine representation of the planets is Venus and the moon. And so basically what they talk about is also the discovery of these planets. And there's a bunch of information at the beginning of the book before they get into breaking down those four asteroids that I mentioned about the discovery of planets, about the discovery of these asteroids. This book was what actually made me understand the concept that for example, when we as people discover a new asteroid or discover a new planet, that planet and asteroids energy kind of comes to the surface and comes becomes a lot more clear to society, if that makes sense. So for example, when we discovered Pallas Athene, Pallas Athene is very much like the war strategist asteroid. She is a very feminine side to Mercury, but she is single, she's very smart. She gives very like, I'm an independent woman, I want to learn, I want to only further my education and I don't need to be with no man kind of vibe. When we discovered her or the asteroid is when we allowed women to go to school, you know, and kind of care more about their education when we allowed them to, when we allowed us to be in politics a little bit more, to have our own jobs, to have our own say, to have kind of a lot more independent thought kind of rise to the surface. You know, when we discovered Pluto as a planet in general, um, the suicide rates spiked like crazy. It was the first sweet time we'd ever seen that. Um, so that was a really interesting concept that I had never actually thought about before this book. This book is fantastic. Yeah, I give this book five stars, honestly. Another really amazing tidbit of information that just helped me completely just wrap my head around the idea of these four asteroids that they said before they even got into explaining them was that they associated Vesta with the first house, Ceres with the fourth house, Juno with the seventh house, and Pallas Athene with the tenth house. And just by them saying that, Thing, like these asteroids made so much more sense to me. And obviously through um, understanding these 
asteroids, you also understand a lot more about the complexities and the dynamics of feminine energy as well. And this book is also why I don't think I will ever follow Vedic astrology because there's just so many new things that we're discovering, so many new things to find out, and they're so relevant with our ever-changing society and our ever-changing culture, and that's what this book talked a lot about. So yeah, would definitely recommend this book if you're really into astrology and you want information about the asteroids that is literally nowhere nowhere to be found online. I would really recommend that book. All right, now we are getting into a little bit of some odd books. So as I mentioned in the Tarot Wisdom book, I started getting into the Golden Dawn and researching the Golden Dawn. And again, this was throughout my phase of trying to figure out which sect of witchcraft I felt like I wanted to follow and belong to the most and resonated the most. I just needed to find out which club and which table I wanted to sit at at lunch, <laughs> which I roll my eyes at now, but whatever. It's a genuine journey that I went through, but whatever. So the next book that I read is The Golden Dawn Ritual tarot by Sheik Cicero and Sandra Tabitha Cicero, if I'm not pronouncing that wrong. And it says, the keys to the rituals, symbolism, magic, and divination. Um, so if you don't know what the Golden Dawn is, it is basically, okay, so if you've ever heard of the Freemasons, the Freemasons is one of the biggest, if not the biggest, secret societies. I mean, not so secret societies. Um, it's basically just a bunch of guys that kind of hold all the keys um, to the world's answers and really kind of are the people that control everything behind the scenes. It's made up of some of the most prolific people or men in the world, as well as some of the richest men in the world, you know, the most influential men in the world. And they are the ones that are making the decisions that we like to think the president is making. It's probably happening in the Freemasonry in actuality. At least that's my opinion, but I don't know. I guess I think my opinion's fact because it's mine, but I guess it's just my opinion. The Freemasons have been around for a long ass time. I don't know when they started. I'll put the year here. And you're only allowed to be a man when you're in the Freemasons. That's like the main thing. And the Freemasons have a lot to do with hermetic symbology. A group of the Freemasons branched off and they created the Golden Dawn Temple. If you know anything about Aleister Crowley, he was infamously part of the Golden Dawn. He was obviously, as we all know, kicked out of the Golden Dawn, but he also made the Golden Dawn very popular, and a lot of the Thoth tarot is taken from Golden Dawn symbology, but I didn't want to get into the Aleister Crowley nonsense at that point, because what he's taking all that information from is the Golden Dawn. And so I was like, I want to go to the source of this information first. So basically the thing with the Golden Dawn is it focuses a lot more, you know, completely actually on ceremonial magic. If you've ever heard the phrase ceremonial magic, what they really mean is Golden Dawn shit. <laughs> Um, that's what ceremonial magic draws its all of its influence from for the most part. If you've ever seen the Ten Sephiriah, which is the Tree of Life, that's the Golden Dawn. Baphomet is actually just a representation of the Tree of Life from the Golden Dawn. That's all he's supposed to be. Okay, and also the big thing with the Golden Dawn is they separated from the Freemasons. They focused exclusively on magic and like it says, ritual symbolism, magic, and divination. That's like their thing. But it was also the first society of that kind that allowed women. So that was a huge, huge, huge part of it. At this time, I was also wanting to take this witchcraft class, I noticed when I went in that he had a lot of stuff um, about the Golden Dawn around it. Like I noticed a few small little symbols here and there that I was like, oh, he's connected to the Golden Dawn. And at this time I was like, I might want to be a part of the Golden Dawn. I might want to join it because it's still, it's still up and running now. It's still relevant now. And I was like, it looks pretty fucking cool. It sounds like they hold a lot of, a lot of interesting information here. Um, and so I wound up taking that witchcraft class because I was like, this might be my end to the Golden Dawn. And I was right. He had direct links to the Golden Dawn 
we studied a lot of the Golden Dawn symbolism and traditions and, you know, I bring in the West, which is the angel Mikhail, or that's probably the wrong association, you know, it was all that sort of stuff. But the Scooby-Doo mask that was lifted up to me is that it's just another form of like strict witchcraft. Like there's just so many rules. <laughs> Like, even more rules than there is in Wicca. And it was like, okay, this isn't fun. This isn't free form. This is just memorizing a script and hoping that you evoke magic. It just felt like an acting class, if I'm being honest. And I'm not trying to act anymore, like, at all. I'm really not interested. And anyway, so I'm... <laughs> I know that I'm going off on a major tangent, but I have a lot to say about the Golden Dawn. Just like my feelings about Wicca, just like my feelings about traditional witchcraft, I am very thankful that I read this book and there is so much interesting information in this book. The Golden Dawn holds so many traditional symbols, but the way that they do tarot is actually usually not the way that we traditionally think about it. Like they don't really tend to shuffle the cards and pull them out as a form of divination, but rather they like will pick one card and study it and meditate with it and use it as almost like another piece on your altar. And so if you're wanting to do a spell about, you know, personal confidence and strong sense of self, you might pick the strength card or whatever the gold. The Golden Dawn associations are very different than our traditional associations. So that's also something to note. So I, this actually came in this little set that I got. And this is literally just the guidebook for that deck. But it's so, so, so much more than just a guidebook, really. This is what the deck backs look like. The point of their tarot deck is not to make a pretty picture. The point of their tarot cards are to show symbol after symbol after symbol. They are kind of like pip decks, uh, actually. Obviously, this is written by two people that are very prominent within the Golden Dawn. This book was kind of hard to read um, because it's so you know, textbooky, information-y, and it really does not feel like it's written by a person. I'd say I kind of stepped away from the idea of wanting to try and be a part of the Golden Dawn because of the fact that I realized that it's just, um, I don't like groups. <laughs> I don't like groups. I'm always asking why, 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 why? And their answer to that is because tradition says so. And I'm like, oh, so it's just literally another religion where you don't know why you're doing things, you're just doing them to just be a part of a group and feel like you're a part of something instead of like actually wanting to learn. And then also I feel like that's just like empty magic. Like I feel like what magic really is, is intent. It doesn't need all these bells and whistles. And I mean, it makes sense that they kicked out Aleister Crowley because if they see too much of an individual with personal choices and personal opinions, they will outcast them because that is a threat to the group. And I'm not even saying I'm on the side of Aleister Crowley, but I will be always on the side of the individual versus the group. And so it makes sense that they kicked him out because he didn't align perfectly with every single little step that they want to make you into. They want you to just be a little servant for the greater group. And so I just found them not really much different in that aspect to Christianity, to Judaism, to any other, to Wicca, you know, even though the information that they hold is so, so great. <laughs> um, like I would still read a lot more about the Golden Dawn. I think it is such important information to have and just a wealth of knowledge. But what I ever, 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 ever want to try to join again? <laughs> no! Fuck no! And ceremonial magic is just boring. <laughs> it's just so boring! It's like, why would you use that traditional language when it's like the cosmic forces know how you speak? You speak like this, so why wouldn't you do your magic in the same kind of tone and cadence that they're used to hearing? Because that's how you talk. Like, anyways. <laughs> So yeah, um, I don't really know how to give this book a rating because it did what it said and it's great for it. But I am a little bit, you know, apprehensive towards the Golden Dawn, even though I still think it's badass. I guess I'll give it like three and a half stars because of my skepticism. Um, yeah, yeah, I guess that's okay. I don't know. All right, I have so much to say about all of these books. <laughs> So this is another book that I have a lot to say about.
out. I don't know we're gonna this fucking shit is so long. Um, but of course, you yeah, come on, I had to read the satanic bible. Duh! <laughs> um, so yeah, the next book that I read is The Satanic Bible by Anton Xander LaVey. Um, I just felt like this is a necessary read. This is like in the required reading. At least I think so. Um, this is a little tiny book. Oh, it's so small. It's so, it's like a little Bible. Oh, oh. I actually liked this book more than I thought I would. But because I feel like so many people have the Satanic Bible as a little bit of like a, um, you know, kitschy thing to have, you know, ooh, spooky, spooky, or whatever it is. And I was like, what is actually in this? And I mean, I am a Capricorn, so that is my ruling tarot card. Um, you know, but I do have a lot of like devil figurines and little trinkets and, you know, pentagrams. And so I was like, I have to stop being a poser and see if this is actually something that sounds kind of cool. And again, <laughs> it's so funny thinking about it now, but I was like, maybe satanism is the path that i want to go down and now i'm like why did i keep trying to do this to myself um i mean within me trying to find this like i'm so thankful i read this book i can honestly i know this might be a little bit surprising but i actually do give this book five stars um am i going to be a satanist no and why because like i mentioned with everything else i'm not looking to join any sort of group i'm not looking to align myself with anything but do I agree with like almost all of the stuff that he wrote about? Fuck yeah, I do. <laughs> this book really just is like why Christianity makes no sense. Why Christianity is stupid. Why Christianity is goofy, you know? And he is so smart. His writing style is so fucking fun. This guy is hilarious. This guy is genuinely funny. There were times when I literally laughed out loud while reading this book. He is such an enjoyable author while being simultaneously really, really smart. I honestly have suspicions that he might be autistic. And I'll talk more about that in the other book that I read by him. And it is the most self-aware book I have ever read. I really like him because he fully knew what he was doing and was very open about it. He was like, I did this to be scary, ooh, satanic Bible, and that's why I use these goofy little symbols and whoa, whoa. I mean, it's actually, it's pink though. He's being funny. Like he made him, he made it pink. Like he's funny. Anyways, um, he does have a lot of good information about witchcraft and you know, satanic witchcraft. And no, it's not that stupid stuff. Like he talks about um, a lot of things like this is why we don't sacrifice people. If you've ever heard the song Beware by Death Grips, this book can be summarized by I am the beast I worship. And that can be an incredibly empowering, incredibly uplifting thing. It's not about worshiping a higher power, and it's also not about worshiping a lower power. It's not even really about worshiping Satan. It's about worshiping yourself as your own god or goddess. Because there's also a lot of things where people will put this idea of hedonism onto Satanism, and he talks a lot of in depth about that as well. He's not about hedonistic activities. What he does talk about is indulgence, and he talks about the difference between hedonism and indulgence and he's anti-hedonism but pro-indulgence and there is a very interesting line it's just a lot of the ideas is living to enjoy life living for now um living to serve yourself and that doesn't mean stepping on everybody else to get what you want but he also goes a step further to talk about it being important to defend yourself and it being important to stand up for yourself. He's like, live your life how you want to live it, you fucktards. Like, you know? The second half of the book talks a lot about, you know, some rituals that you can do, you know, gets into more of the, you know, actual satanic rituals and that sort of stuff, which I don't really have an interest in. But this is going to sound crazy, but um, I marked up this book quite a bit. And this book is like really close to my heart now. And it's something that if I ever have a kid, I would probably give to them on their 18th birthday to read. It felt a little bit 
a little bit young for me. Um, but I think it's the perfect thing to read when you're going into adulthood and there's a lot of options in front of you and you don't know what to do, you don't know which path to take, there's a bunch of people kind of telling you what to do um, and this book kind of teaches you to listen to yourself. And it came to me in a time in my life when I was teaching myself to make my own choices and I really needed to teach myself that I have control over my life and that I can choose to leave a situation that I don't want to be in. Um, I have the power to make my own own decisions even if they're hard I you know have the power to stand up for myself I do not need to fall into a victim mentality there's a difference to being a victim versus allowing yourself to be victimized by that situation and that's also kind of something that I feel like he taught me as well it's incredibly empowering it was a big reason why I wanted to leave the witchcraft class I was taking and step away from trying to get involved with the golden dawn at all and just kind of be my own witch this really set me towards that path even though it is a path into itself it really doesn't need to be and he knows that so I really could not recommend this book more it is a great book five stars like even if you have no interest in the devil and satan and all that mushy stupid ass shit if you are feeling disempowered if you are feeling victimized if you are a person you should read this book. Like, I really recommend this book over almost any other book that I've read. I know! Um, yes, it is a little bit young for me. Like I said, that's why I would give it to an 18 to 20 year old. Um, but we can always use these lessons. And it's fun! It's like one of the only books that I read that was fucking fun and funny and made me laugh. Anyways, I feel very passionately about this book, it seems. All right, we're coming to the end here. This is the second to last book in this part. And this is um, very much kind of off to a completely different side. Still nonfiction. Um, but this is called Satan Came to Eden, a survivor's account of the Galapagos affair by Dor Strouch. Dore Strouch. Oh, I'm probably pronouncing her name incorrectly. So this book is based off of what was at the time at least one of my favorite documentaries ever which is the Gal a Galapagos Affair. I basically this is the couple I'll show you them. This is Frederick. They're German. Um, this is Frederick and Dor, Dory, Dory, Dor, oh, I forget whatever. They um, are a couple that hated society and civilization. They decided to move away from Germany and become completely self-reliant and self-dependent and move to the Galapagos Island. The documentary tells that tale as obviously the book does too. Um, so the documentary also the reason why it's called Satan Came to Eden is because you know, they had that whole situation where they were living sustainably by themselves on the island with um, a few people here and there to help. They tried to keep it really hush-hush that they were living there and they really didn't want anybody to know. Um, but then somehow um, they kind of got some ship or somebody kind of got news of it and it went out in the newspaper that there were these, this couple living on the Galapagos Island and then this like baroness, very like Leo person, um, kind of gotten wind of it. And she decided to bring her two boyfriends basically to the Galapagos Island to settle it because she wanted to build a hotel. Um, and so she can, you know, basically make money, have people come to the hotel and stay. And she was a very extravagant figure. Like think of somebody that would want to be in the Great Gatsby. You know, she lied about all these things and she told all these tall tales about who she was and things that she has. She's a very, um, socialite, like, you know, able to draw you in kind of fake facade kind of person, which couldn't be more opposite to these two. Frederick was 1000% like ridiculously autistic. Um, and Dory might have even been too, honestly. So they were very opposite. They don't want anybody around. It winds up being like a murder mystery, basically. A, a bunch of people wound, wind up dead. And um, Dory is one of, or Dor, um, is one of the few people that kind of survived the situation and she wrote this book <laughs> um, to document her situation and all that sort of stuff. So that's the documentary. This book focuses a lot more 
on the time leading up to them leaving for the Galapagos and the time before the Baroness came to the Galapagos. So she talks a lot more in depth about how they started their relationship, why they decided to go out, what it was like to pack, what it was like to start out there, um, and that whole kind of story going into it before the Baroness came. She obviously talked about that too, but the majority, majority of the book is before she came, which was really, really interesting. However, after reading this, um, if you're a huge, like, super fan of the documentary, which I'm like, who is a super fan of the documentary other than me? <laughs> If you watch the documentary and you're like a super fan, like, yeah, I'll fucking read the book. It's way interesting. But if you um, are wanting to know, like, oh, should I read the book or should I just watch the documentary? You just need to watch the documentary. You don't need to read the book. She is obviously not an author. And that's a very, very clear throughout the whole story. You can just tell she doesn't really know how to write and she doesn't really know how to tell a story, honestly. She also showed how shockingly unprepared they were. They were so unprepared for this and they had this um like native boy, they called him an even more offensive term in the book, I can't remember his name, um, who really like showed them around and taught them how to do everything and like they wouldn't have survived without this boy, like at all. Oh, Hugo, I think his name is Hugo the boy if I'm not mistaken. A lot of the story is like their conflict with him and you know because he would go around and like kill a bunch of the animals and they were both vegetarians and they didn't want that to happen and Dor like kind of even talking about her getting lonely, her missing people, her struggling with the relationship with Frederick because he drew kind of more and more inward and got more and more cold as the relationship went on. Um, so it's kind of more of an inside look in that way. They did act a lot out of their selfish desires throughout this book and they really did force themselves to kind of be the main characters of this situation and kind of got mad at anybody else including their family that would like stand in their way. They both were I think married to somebody else or something like that and they kind of made their partners wind up like living together while they went off and it was like a really weird situation. And in the documentary, I really fell in love with the couple and I, they definitely in the documentary really idealized them and kind of made them out to be something they're not. But when I read the book, I realized that they were really selfish and really ignorant, really clueless to what they were doing. And it kind of left um, much more of a bad taste in my mouth about them and their experience. And I still like, yeah, I think the Baroness is still a little bit fucked up, but I also think they're kind of fucked up and wrong too, in a way. Um, but it was an interesting read. I'm glad I read it. Um, it made that documentary not my favorite documentary anymore, which is really interesting. And so if I separate this book from the documentary, I'd probably only give this book three stars. If it sounds like something you're interested in, check it out, but I would watch the documentary before I read the book. All right, we are finally to the last book that I'm going to talk about today, and that is this lovely, lovely gem. Um, this is an encyclopedia of psychological astrology by Charles E. O. Carter. So I actually didn't find this book. My boyfriend found this book. Um, he is is like insanely good at picking out books for me. If you ever go to a psychic guy, check out the used book section. It's far better than their new books. And he would go and he would just pick out a book and he would just know that it's the book for me to read. And that was, this was the first time he did that. Um, I read this book in a few days. This book is fantastic. I'm not sure how rare it is. I'm not sure if you can find it, but if you can, holy shit, I would fucking recommend this to you. I don't even need to get on with the review. Five stars. This is such amazing information that you cannot, you cannot find online and its accuracy is absolutely astounding. It basically goes through different psychological personality traits like uh, it's an encyclopedia but it's read like a book. So for example we're like let's start with P. It talks about pneumonia, you know, so it says pneumonia is caused by affliction in Gemini Sagittarius, usually near the sixth degree. And then he always uses examples. So he's the example female, and then he gives the time and the birth chart. And he explains that person's birth chart and in the, in the inflictions as to why he thinks they have pneumonia. You know, on the other page, it talks about like pity. 
Pity is symbolized by Venus and Pisces, which that makes so much sense. But both Benefics and the Water Trigon, as well as Libra, are normally extremely quick in sympathy. Also true. Anyways, this book is still to this day one of the best books that I have read about astrology. And I will cherish this book for forever because it's indispensable information. And the amount of examples and like data that he had to go through to get this information is amazing. And I would definitely read this book again because there's just so much information that you cannot find anywhere, anywhere else. And it gave me so much of the knowledge that I now have. And this is why, not to get on my pedestal, but this is why reading is so important, especially if you study something like astrology or something of an occult nature, because there's so much information that hasn't necessarily been lost, but with our new emerging technology, like I love the internet, I have a big heart for it, I'm not trying to talk shit about it, but I also think that we should use internet and you know sharing information that way but we also cannot forget about all the knowledge from years past that has been put into books and this is a great example it says the first edition was published in 1924 and the fourth edition which is what i have was published in 1955. it's like we have known this stuff for so long and if you're at all somebody that's interested in like health and ailments and like why we hurt the way we do which i'm very interested in as i have sixth house stuff um this book is a great great thing like five stars if you are an advanced astrologer if you are beginner inter or intermediate you will not understand a thing this book is saying but if you're an advanced astrologer and you're f you feel like you've run out of information to read and learn about first of all just pick up a used book <laughs> you will find a lot of information but if second of all if you're looking for a specific book recommendation this is the one to read like it's one of my favorite most amazing prolific books I've ever read that guy is a genius and like I bow my head to him I have the ultimate respect for that man and all he's done so god I love this thing I will jerk off this guy's writing for forever all right oh <sighs> for reading I just talked a lot <laughs> Um, I hope that you guys enjoyed this video and I hope that you guys are enjoying this series. Don't forget that I have an astrology TikTok, I have a personal Instagram, and I sell birth chart readings. So all those links will be down below. Also, my email is open. It will be linked down below if you'd like to ask an astrology question or just advice-based question to be featured in an upcoming video. Thank you so much for sticking it to the end. All right, that was a weird way to say it, but let's move forward. Thank you so much for watching. Bye!